right, so settle everyone. And I am rolling and action. I'm Joyce DiDonato, and this is Living the Classical Life. I don't want to brag, <laughs> but they do sometimes call me one take Di Donato. Oh my, <laughs> one take Di Donato. <laughs> Joyce Di Donato, we are so happy to welcome you to Living the Classical Life. Thanks for being on. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Back in 1997, someone very prominent in London told you that you have nothing to offer artistically. And look what has happened since then. What do you make of an episode like that? That was 20 years ago. I just dawned on me. And it was the same time of year. It was really 20 years ago, almost to the day. <gasps> You know, it's one of the best things that ever happened to me. And I would never have said that at the time. Of course, it felt like death. Um, it, it's exaggerated, but a kind of soulful kind of death when I heard that. Because at that time, I was about 28, and I was starting to get everything coordinated, and I was starting to get some success in terms of my technique and my singing. And uh, I was still in a young artist training program in Houston, but it was starting to, the pieces were starting to fall together. And I had had a lot of critiques over the years about the quality of my singing, or it's too sharp, or it's too harsh, or the Eva was this, or, and a lot of things that I thought, okay, that's tangible, I know how to work with that. But nobody had questioned what I was saying as an artist, which was the entire reason I was singing. I wasn't singing to be a singer, I was singing to express and connect and communicate. And to have somebody respected and at the top of the field say, you really have nothing to say as an artist was really devastating in a, in a profound way. Realizing that you know, he's not a, wasn't an evil person and just interested in, um, in, in just torturing me, I thought, OK, after a lot of crying and a few weeks of sort of processing and you know trying to get back up on my feet. Did you stop altogether? No, no, no. I had to go back and, and go right back into the Houston Grand Opera. And like my first day back, I found out they were taking me off a lead role for a new premiere coming. And I was being sort of, in my eyes, demoted clearly, but in their eyes, reappropriated to another role. And I was like, it was supposed to be my role. And I got, so it was just one of these things that happens. Ask any artist, you know, these things come in series and it's just blow, blow, blow. And you think, ah, I was on such a good track and now it's all gone. So I was trying to sort of get my center back. And I started trying to analyze it, say, okay, let's be practical about this. Why would he say it? I was well prepared, I was singing well, um, I have a, and it started to dawn on me, I was arriving on the scene, this was a song competition, so even more of a sort of sacred space about how you're supposed to be as a singer, and I was perfectly coached, I was perfectly prepared, I was perfectly primmed and proper, and the hair was what an opera singer is supposed to look like, and the dress was just artsy enough, but conservative enough. And I arrived like a caricature of an opera singer. And the hand was on the piano, and everything was correct. I thought, my god, he's right. I'm not saying anything. I don't have anything to say as an artist. I'm regurgitating what I'm supposed to do, according to conservatory and according to the coaches and the da la 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 la. And I went, well, that's the last time anybody's going to be able to say that about me. And I had better go figure out what it is that I have to say. So I really, I look at it completely as a gift. And I look at it as one of the most important, actually, things that could have happened. Because there is this tendency, I think in particular for opera singers, because our development is so late. And there's so many things we have to align before we can even stand up and do anything. Language, technique, musicality, dramatic instincts, all of this. That 
we are just trying to get it right for a long time. And getting it right is a fundamental starting point. But at some point, we then have to make it ours. And we have to understand what it is we want to say within the confines of musical style and Mozart's language and the text. We have to breathe life into it that comes from a place of, of awareness of ourselves, of the world around us, and a kind of freedom that I'm not so interested in being correct, but I'm interested in finding the truth of, of this piece. So if this was the point at which you broke free, well, I'm thinking about all the other students out there who received discouraging advice. Uh, well, why, why didn't you listen to what he said in a sense that you stopped? I mean, how do we really know if we're in conservatory and someone tells us you're not going to make it and you better yeah. not even try? Should you try to persist through that? Or do you just, <laughs> is there a point at which you give up? I mean, why didn't you listen to him on that level? To all of those, can I talk to the camera? Yes. I love you guys, hang in there. It's devastating, I know, I know, I know. There's no, there's no way for me to answer that question. And if I'm very honest, I don't think that's always a bad thing because I think not everybody is cut out for this world of, of being a top level performing musician. One thing I'm quite convinced about is the journey of a young artist from, you know, pianists and, you know, of course you starting much younger, Opera singers tend to start a little bit later in college years. Um, what you are going to have to, the fire you're going to have to walk through to train yourself as a musician, whether it brings you to a professional career or not, will be one of the greatest strengths you ever have in your life because you have to look at yourself. You have to um, employ every aspect of your being to go into that world of music and to do it in a solitary kind of way. It's just you and the piano, it's you and the voice, it's you and your violin, and it's a solitary path so much of the time, and so you have to find things within yourself that get you through those hard times. So those skills that you're acquiring, those kind of personal skills as well as the musical and intellectual and all of that, those will inform your life no matter what direction it takes. Were you always a resilient person? Yes, I think so. I've never thought about it. Why is that? Yeah. Where did that come from? Was your family like that? Yeah, I mean, I'm from the Midwest. I'm, it's this idea of, you know, I was working when I was 13. I had three jobs going through college because you have to, you know, get to work. Pick yourself up, come on, decide now. I'm, you know, get out there and go do the work that you're supposed to do. This kind of pick yourself up, move on. Yeah, it was just, it wasn't an option actually. The other, everybody has hard times, everybody has difficulties, so just get busy. You're no, it's not any harder for you than anyone else. This kind of very practical boot worker kind of um, Midwest thing, yeah. You mentioned age 13. I think that was the, the, the period at which you wrote a letter to Ronald Reagan. Oh! <gasps> how did you know oh that? Oh my goodness. How, I did. What were you trying to do with I that? I was trying to stop nuclear war. <laughs> I swear to God. I was so upset at him and Gorbachev and I thought we're in a cold war. This was like probably 1983, something like that. And I wrote him a letter and I said, you're being ridiculous, basically. And I said, if the two of you could just sit down face to face and talk, you'll understand how ridiculous this is. And I got a lovely, polite, generic reply. The president really appreciates the voice. Da, da, da. But I think it worked. Maybe there's another letter in my future immediately that I should be writing right now. But yeah, I just, yeah, I was trying to stop nuclear war. With these. And I thought, why shouldn't I write that letter? <laughs> I know that human rights have been of particular interest for you. Uh, to, uh, I think it was about two years ago that I saw on, on PBS, or it was an NPR feature, but you visited the Stonewall Inn. Yeah. And you sang in honor of victims of hate crimes. Why was this important for you at the site of the start, arguably, of the LGBT rights movement? Um, because everything that the direction of, of what so much of 
of, um, well, let me start that over, that this emergence of, of hate and separation and division and us and them is just intolerable to me. And it's, it makes me angry to see um, people marginalized and diminished and, and not, not being given the same basic rights and respect. This, this loss of seeing human being to human being um, it saddens me. It just saddens me. And you know, we now are all these labels. It's LGBTQ, and black and Muslim and Catholic and Kansan and girl and boy. And it's exhausting. It's exhausting. And it doesn't interest me at all to, to play into that game. And, and I prefer to put my energy into um, joining and, and um, um, connecting. Human to human. You chose to sing a very particular number for that. What did you choose to sing? Dido's Lament of Purcell, which is about 400 years old. And um, she's had a rough life of it, <laughs> poor Dido. And um, she's been betrayed and, and left. And, and she decides to kill herself. A very interesting story about that. Um, but it's the, the anthem of the piece is remember me, remember me, but forget my fate. And it's important that, that we remember the people who have um, suffered at the hands of ignorance and, and hate. And what was the response to that? The, the reason I ask is there is some question as to whether the world of art and politics can combine. If you look at the 19th century, it was almost the same thing. Almost yeah. every great work was written in defense of some idea. Yeah. I mean, look at all of Beethoven, for example. Maybe everyone liked what you did there that day, but were there some people who said you shouldn't, shouldn't mix music and politics? Not in this case, but I have been outspoken about a few other things, and, uh, and it rubs people the wrong way. They want to come to see their opera and not have any uh, interference. And I respect that. I understand that if you've spent $20 or $320 on a ticket, you are not coming to a political rally. You want a beautiful musical experience. I understand that and I respect it. And I, my um, challenge right now is how do I walk this path of being an engaged citizen without interfering with the world of being an opera singer, etc. However, I don't know of any opera that's been written that doesn't have a political bent of some sort. Marriage of Figaro, Les Troyens, or... Um, Don Carlo. Don Carlo, yeah, Norma, uh, which, you know, I'm at right now, is, you know, the Romans and the Druids and we want war. No, it's, the, these are the, the innate responses of creative people that are trying to make sense of their world. It's that political fingerprint of that time. And we sort of have sanitized it to say, oh, no, 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 this is just beautiful music. No, these were acts of revolution in some cases. And we can't pretend that we're separate from that. And we also can't pretend that music and the arts don't have huge impact on the social fabric of where we are. And I, you know, I've spent 40 years on this planet, <laughs> and I've always known peace, especially after I wrote my letter to Ronald Reagan and, Broker, broker, you know, the end of the Cold War. <laughs> uh, I've always known peace. I, I didn't know the Vietnam War. Then all of a sudden, the last 10 years, uh, the, all of that balance is upset. I'm not only here to be an opera singer and, and sing on the stage of the Met. I'm a citizen. I'm a human being. And I just cannot um, disengage from that or pretend that somehow my art and my life is separate from what I'm seeing. I wouldn't sleep well at night. But I, again, I, I have to find the balance where um, I still want people to come and have a musical experience. They're entitled to that without the weight of, of being in a rally of some sort. So I don't know if I always get that balance correct or not, but that's, that's what I'm working on. But if we look at it, we as artists are such sensitive people. And for me, 
my best work requires at least some sense of equilibrium. How do you sen feel, how do you maintain a certain sense of peace when you read about everything going on in the world? Well, I, I tell you, this, this last year has been um, a huge journey for that because I came out with this project in War and Peace, Harmony Through Music, which That's is right. a Baroque album, but it's become much bigger than that. This was after the Paris attacks? In 15, November of 15, I was set to do another kind of recording and I was looking at the world and say, I can't, I just can't do some kind of academic vanity project of interesting, obscure arias from Naples right now. It just doesn't make sense to me. And Dido was there on my piano and I thought, this is what I need to sing about. I need to sing about, about the world today and these huge um, conflicts that we're feeling socially, politically, but personally for so, I think that's where so much of this is all, there's so much fear happening, there's so much disconnect, and I needed to address it. I think for myself, most of all, ultimately, it was probably a very selfish project. But the, uh, we recorded the project, and then the first concert of the tour was one week after the U.S. elections. Hmm. And I've since done 20 concerts going through June after Manchester bombings, after the inauguration, after <coughs> Merkel standing up in, in Berlin and saying, well, we're on our own, after Brexit, after all of this. And the world is radically different than it was a year ago, radically different. And I want to talk about it. And I want to invite people in for a kind of communal experience in the theater and say, are we okay? Yeah, because right now, through this music, we are finding a kind of balance. We're finding harmony here. Okay, can we open the door to the concert hall, find a taxi, and maintain that peace and that for just a little bit? And can we take the example of what we feel in the concert hall and integrate that into our lives a little bit more? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I get the sense that you're taking it perhaps even one step further beyond what Leonard Bernstein said. I think his, his famous quip, I'm probably paraphrasing, where he said, this will be our response yeah. to violence to make music ever more passionately and fervently than before. Yeah. Well, it's, it's something beautiful to say, but I always reacted a little bit against that because I felt like that doesn't go far enough. Uh. I think I perceive that you have a platform and it seems like you're also using it in addition to just making your music. Well, I'll tell you, throughout this project, there was a quote that a good friend of mine sent me, and that has been like my totem through this. And it's by Jonathan Larson, who's the playwright for Rent. And I, I don't know if this is in a play or, or not, but, but it's a quote of his where he said, the opposite of war is not peace, it's creation. Hmm. There we go. I love that because when you say, yeah, we need peace, we need peace, and you're like, okay, where is it? Where's the peace? We need peace, people. Where's the peace? You know, and it's arbitrary and it's a moving target, and it's and then we feel upset if we can't find it. I'm not at peace. I'm anxious. That makes me more nervous. Creation is proactive. It's concrete. It can happen on the smallest scale. It can happen on, as certainly as artists, we're creating music, but you can create dialogue. You can create. A quiet space. You can create a beautiful ambient where you know you can create conversation with people. You can create. If you're busy creating, you're not destroying anything. And I found that to be. I love Bernstein's quote. Of I course, do too, of course. But again, it's a little bit okay. This I find somehow more imperative. And when I have not wanted to get out of bed, and when I've not wanted to put on my makeup and go sing and pretend that everything is right in the world because I'm doing a, a concert for peace when I'm saying, what difference is this making? I'm not making a difference doing this, you know? I say, no, okay, but I can do this right now. And in those two hours, I've created an atmosphere of relief and, and um, something tangible that people can experience and feel. I'm good with that. Hmm. I'm good with that. Take me back to the beginning of when you were growing up in Kansas. I'm trying to get a sense of someone from the Midwest aspiring to 
an operatic career, or, or was that something you, in fact, did? Could you have even pictured the life that you have now? Never, never. No, I didn't, I wasn't even dreaming of it, because it wasn't like I, no. Um, I was the girl in my bedroom with the hairbrush, singing along to Jesus Christ Superstar and Barbra Streisand. And my sister had great LP collection, um, bread, <laughs> sticks. <laughs> <laughs> Showing my age a little bit. And I, and I was singing, and I would even sometimes, oh my God, I would be walking to like our pool in the summer, and I'd go up for swim practice or something, and I would sometimes dare to sing on the street. And I was like, maybe somebody will hear me and discover me. But it was more to like be a backup singer to Billy Joel, or, you know, maybe to kind of be in the chorus of a Broadway show. It wasn't, I was never the chosen kind of star, so I never looked at myself that way. I just wanted, I could tell I wanted to be on stage. Um, but then, you know, that good Midwest service, vocational kind of, you gotta contribute to the world kind of thing. And, 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 you know, don't, you're no better than anybody else. Don't, don't be too good. Do good work, but be modest. And it was all that kind of, kind of thing. It wasn't like you've gotta go out and be number one. And it wasn't that kind of upbringing. It was very Catholic and vocational and all that. And I, th I went to college to be a good high school music teacher. I thought that's, I'm gonna be a teacher, I'm gonna be the, hopefully the cool teacher that you know does choir and all that. And I really, I think I would have been very good at it and I would have enjoyed it. And boy, would my life look very different, very different. Um, and I probably would have been okay with that. But in college, sort of my junior year, I was studying voice. I had played piano, I was studying voice just to help with the choral aspect of teaching. And something started to like bubble up with inside of me because I was starting to understand how organic the voice actually is. When I would hear opera singing, all I heard was, oh, 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 oh. you know, I just thought, oh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> but understanding it from the inside out rather than attending a performance and being blown away, I came to it from a very internal way. And I just, it blew me away because of what I got to sing about, the poetry, the history, the psychology, the truth, the beauty of it all. It started to really intoxicate me. And, um, and I got sort of stuck because I thought, but I should be teaching because that's like the noble thing to do. And performing sort of feels really selfish, but I really like it and I don't know what to do. And my dad said, you know, Joyce, there's more than one way to teach people. And there's more than one way to reach out and communicate. And I went, oh? And I feel he gave me, it was probably the best gift he ever gave me. It was, it gave me permission to sort of go into this world on, on my terms. Which coming back to that first question about being the opera singer, that was a big part of, I want to do this as me. And I don't need to fit into what it's supposed to look like. And, and yeah. So in the world of authenticity for ourselves as artists, I look at the way performers are being marketed today and I wonder if you ever felt pressure to pander to an image that had nothing to do with you. I did in the early years, the, the sort of the beginning years at AVA in Philadelphia where it felt like you had to sort of play the part of opera singer, which is exactly what put me in, in that position where somebody said, you have nothing to offer as an artist. Because I was sort of playing the part of diva. They expected you to walk in and, and present yourself as, as Kalas, as Scotto, and they wanted this air of diva. And I worked so hard at it, and I was so bad. And people would look and go, what are you saying? This, it was so clearly not me. And also, I hated it because I thought, I love being in character on stage. Oh my God, that's a lot of work to then come off stage and still be in character. And you know, the, ugh, I just, it didn't suit me. And funnily enough, it, this was a long process for me to sort of figure that out and, and figure out who I was and what I was saying. This was, you know, mid thirties that I started to kind of go, ah, oh, okay, this is making sense to me now. The second, I let that come out is when 
I sort of switched into a higher gear in my career. Where if people were like, oh, Joyce DiDonato, you know? There was, I was working for a long time at a good level, and I was a very kind of reliable singer, and I was good houses, good roles, but I hadn't quite, you know, the recording contract hadn't come, and, and I wasn't being given new productions and things. That stuff started happening, not because I was singing better, but I was arriving on the stage, of, you know, not, but in this life as myself. And that's when it really started clicking in. Did you ever feel like your career was growing so fast that you didn't feel ready to handle it? There have been some periods that I looked at the stack of music on my piano and I went, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, and sleepless nights because of uh, the, the panic of being prepared and getting everything learned. But in terms of, of like trajectory of just career, it has come steadily, I mean, fast, but at a steady pace and organically. And I've always felt like I had the pedal on the accelerator and when I wanted to add a little bit more I could and I could also take it off. So I've never felt out of control. I think a big reason for that is that I was, it, I was a very late bloomer. I, I had somebody, or one of my dear friends tell me early on, you're either famous before you're 30 or after. But I was surrounded by all these people getting super famous before 30, and I was like, I'm never going to make it. What's happening? And I have nothing to offer as an artist. And, you know, all of that panic. Thank God. You know, I made my Met debut when I was 35. That's over the hill today. But when it started to come, I had done all this work. I was ready, and I felt... I felt like the, the work that was coming to me I had earned, mm -hmm. and I felt when I walked on stage then that I was owning the artistry that I was bringing on the stage and the technique. I'd, because it didn't come so early and super fast, it, it came in an organic way, and, and I've been able to build on it and not be thrown off course. That having been said, I mean, just for the record, it's... I'm doing more than I, like I said earlier, ever, ever, ever dreamed of. I, this was not my path. I didn't expect this to happen. But I'm happy it did. <laughs> Is this level of devotion and dedication and commitment that you have, does that translate to a level of sacrifice that mm. this achievement that you have in music, is that necessarily at the expense of accomplishment, if you would call it that, on a personal level? Oof. So, um, if we have this conversation at different periods of my life, I would answer it very differently. Because there are times that it felt like I was sacrificing everything for it. Not everything, that's actually not quite fair. But And there were certainly times that I thought, what am I doing? I'm never home. I miss all the birthdays. I miss da 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 da. I'm not there for my friends to bring them chicken noodle soup when they're sick. Or um, where I sit today, I think everything has served a purpose, and I have found the way to make sure that my life is the center for me, and what's happening in my career is a through a thread going through it, but it's not my life. So I work very hard to be present wherever I am, even if it's not the city where a birthday is happening or where a loved one is. I can be fully present here, make the most of where I am, and also cut out all the stuff that just doesn't serve me anymore, so I don't waste energy on that. And where I am now, is a beautiful moment in my life. And so while I've been sacrificing, on the other hand, I'm, I'm surrounded in this world that is just magical to me. And it's, my life is music and connecting with people and Mozart and Bellini and London and Paris and Tokyo and a good coffee and uh, I don't know I, 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 
I think artists can look at it in one of two ways, everything that's missing or everything that's present. And I've kind of trained myself in a way to be much more on that side of things. I'm not always there, to be sure. And, you know, there's been some really gut-wrenching moments in life that, and then as the singing kind of pulls you back in, and then it kind of becomes medicinal at the same time. And it, and it becomes, for me anyway, coming back home. It's sort of ground, ground zero for me. Let's say you're backstage at Carnegie Hall. You know that you have an exuberant aria that you need to sing. You have all these running 16th notes that you have to nail, and people will know if you don't. Yeah. How do you, what's going through your mind at that moment? Well, at that point, um, if I've done my work, if I've really done my work and preparation and it's in there, uh, I have a certain level of confidence that I've prepared as best as I can and it's going to be there. And so my, I rarely think about hitting all the notes. My idea in that case is this is non più mesta, or this is bel raggio, and I'm really in the expressive mode of that character and the text. And the notes are happening because of the way I've prepared for two years. And is this sense of confidence, is that something that you feel emotionally, or is that something that you intellectually try to convince yourself of? No. If you try and do it intellectually, you sort of fake it till you make it, uh, that'll get you 60% of the way there. But then we know ourselves so well, we can tell that it's that we're faking it, and then we get nervous. We're like, no, 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 it's not there, it's not there. So I don't think we can do it cognitively. It has to be, certainly as musicians, there has to be a certain level that we've done the dry, technical, boring, pedantic, technical work that we know it's in the brain, it's in the fingers, it's all that. That doesn't mean it can't go awry on stage. But we at least know that it's there and we're setting ourselves up for success in that way. It's this kind of, I need to share this with you. That's, I think, I've never articulated it like that before. But when I'm in the zone, and I'm not always in the zone, when I'm there, I'm trusting the preparation that I've done. And then that exuberance is this, I need to tell you this. Hmm. Lasha. And I'm not going, I'm not thinking any of that. I'm saying, let me weep. And that's where that mm, comes from. But I can't get to that point until all of that foundation has been laid and I'm, I'm trusting it. So Joyce, one of the defining moments for me as a pianist was hearing in my hometown of Urbana, Illinois, Cecilia Bartoli come and give a concert. Ah. I don't think I've ever experienced, at least in person, such exuberance in music making. And I know that she was a particular influence on yeah. you. What was that influence? Uh, it, when I was in college and I had just made this turn to going opera, opera, can I do that? And my teacher had, had started to give me Rossini, but I don't know, for the opera lovers here, you'll get a kick out of this. It wasn't Rosina that she gave me because I had no top notes. My first Rossini opera aria was Berta's aria from the Barber of Seville. <laughs> and I actually took her to a competition. And the poor panel, they see this like tw 21, 22 year old girl was the McAllister Awards in Indianapolis. And it was my first competition like outside the state of Kansas. And I brought in, and I, you know, 21, 22 years old, mezzo. Il vecchiotto cerca moglie. And I thought, this is probably the only time in the history of opera that somebody has presented that aria for competition. <laughs> and the panel just, I remember them going, excuse me, Joyce, um, have you ever considered Rosina? And I went, oh, I don't have the high notes. <laughs> I didn't win. Maybe that answers the question of why I was a slow starter in this. Um, what was the question? What was the question? Talking about Cecilia Bartoli's yes, particular yeah, thank you. influence. So, yes, so when I was in college, and at, at that point, starting with Berta, but Rossini was clearly going to be a world that I went in. She had just burst onto the scene on this PBS special, uh, and it was from Italy. And I had been listening to recordings of, you know, all the great coloratura people, uh, mezzos, but then here was this... Uh, 
unleashed woman who was not with a bun and this at the piano going, Una voce. She was going, Una. And, and I, it was like an explosion of energy, of joy, of freedom. And I didn't know opera could be that way. I was like, no, opera looks like this. And she was like, opera looks like this. And that blew me away. And of course, the coloratura was like, oh, OK, so that's the bar now. Like, they, if I want to do Rossini, I have to be at that level. More than that, it was the way she used the text. The way she expressed that I know everybody talks about her coloratura, but for me, it's what she does with the words and colors that I just went, ah, that's, that's what I want. That's what I want to aspire to be. And so as I was just getting turned on to the world of opera, she was exploding into the world of opera, and, and I, I learned a lot from her. Hmm. Yeah. So I have a last story to tell you. So back in Illinois, my mother and father have bought an enormous TV. And one of the first things I saw them do was watch YouTube videos of you singing. Oh, my, you're kidding. <laughs> yes. My, this is actually, that's the first time I witnessed you performing, you know, more than just on a, well. on a recording. So w what this makes me curious about is when you're performing, say, in Carnegie Hall, and you know it's being recorded and this is going to be on YouTube, does it enter into your mind that there is at some point down the road, a whole audience that you will never see, and perhaps they will never witness you live, but they're out there. Or can it, you not think about that? No, I don't think about that at all when I'm on stage. It's, that's, I'm in the, there's no space for that in my head when I have to sing. And even the cameras, I don't, I love, actually, I love the cameras being there not for the way I look when I sing or anything like that, but I just, I love that there's that measure that the second I become inauthentic, it shows. Hmm. So it's just that reminder of like, don't go, you be in the zone. And I like that check for me. Um, I think the reason it dawns on me off stage is because of the social media world that we live in. I'm hearing from these people there's uh, a young baritone from India, and he's on Instagram or Twitter, and will come see shows. And he said, I, I, "I have been taught voice by you, watching your classes in India because we don't have teachers." And now he's just got accepted in Vienna, into one of the programs there in Vienna. Um, at Carnegie Hall, the first streaming of Medici, I, I tweeted out or Facebooked out, "Let me know where you're watching tonight." And one of the first responses was, we've just hooked up the satellite and we're watching from the South Pole. <laughs> and you're like, what is the, it's a little bit weird, but I, that is one of the, the sort of factors with the social media is, I hear from Korea and India and the South Pole and all these places, or, you know, Tulane, and Prairie Village, Kansas, that people are connecting and watching in. And, and I take that really seriously. It's pre there's a hunger out there for it. There's an, there's an audience for it. And they're experiencing things that I, w if, that had, if I'd had that when I was growing up, <gasps> I would have just absorbed it all. I still do. I go in and I watch master classes and things. It's incredible what is out there. Joyce. On behalf of all of us here at Living the Classical Life, including uh, the fabulous crew behind the camera, thank you so much for being here and for joining us and sharing your life uh, insights. It was a thrill for me personally. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> it was my pleasure.
Das ist fun. Das ist fun. <lacht> <lacht>